so what they do is they introduce something called a muchige or technically ceiling. yeah you could call it a wooden fall ceiling okay so they seal the central portion up okay so you have some space left on top which is your attic okay. or atta Mm-hmm. which they used to say uh, store, store a lot of mm. uh, their agricultural black produce money. not Just black money. <laughs> today yeah i'm sure they do <laughs> basic logic is if it's available within your context and when i say within your context without transport it's hardly mm-hmm. a kilometer mm-hmm. with the transport you can look at 5 to 10 kilometers if not i'm not talking about like lmvs yeah 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 I'm talking about bullock carts maybe 5 mm-hmm. five, five kilometers at the max and no roads back then mm-hmm. to transport your materials so easily today you have trucks and you have jcbs and mm-hmm. earth movers and you know name you uh, 3d printers yeah Spray, 3d printers <laughs> maybe could be a future yeah. future of it i'm I actually mean, talking to somebody about people in it. Uh, 50 years would say Uh, today we have 3D printers additive manufacturing yeah. back then we used to carry in trucks and <laughs> trucks and <laughs> absolutely haven't you thought about mud have. 3D printer <laughs> i have in fact i'm actually going to explore that very soon yeah still... everybody has tried concrete 3D printing concrete. nobody has tried yeah, uh, yeah. earth 3D. 3D printing i believe yeah. there somebody has it's it not in india but i i believe they have tried it in uh, france if i'm not wrong okay Yeah so France I believe has an earth institute um and all Oh that one looks like uh like uh no like an anthill yeah yeah anthill, yeah yeah, anthill, yeah. yeah. So- hey guys welcome to the fifth episode of Qwert podcast and today's episode is going to be very special very niche traditional historic modern and uh, that's going to be Tulu architecture for those of you who did not get this it's an architectural style in and around mangalore to talk about this special topic we have a special guest today let's welcome architect sampreet rao hi 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 welcome to the podcast thanks clinton thanks for having me yes so sampreet is the chief architect is a designer and he runs his own studio called uh, studio neralu which means shadow a beautiful name is also a teaching faculty in manipal school of architecture in this podcast we're going to dive into a greater detail into tulu architecture from its right from its history origin design component structure and uh, cultural and uh, what else what else am i missing in uh, what else are we going to discuss today the, the context context the, the relationship with the people the okay. climate and Correct. how it all interweaves together. Correct. Yeah. And also and this is going to be incomplete if we don't discuss Guttu Mane. Absolutely. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to discuss about that and then um uh then I will be I I'm personally curious about your views on Vastu which mm-hmm. is a predominant in the region. Yeah. And uh and finally uh I want to go through your portfolio top 3. So sure. perfect. Let's yeah. start. Yeah. Cool. Uh walk us through your background. Well, um where do I start? No, no your background. <laughs> ah, ah, this background. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um this is something that I picked up from one of my antique dealers. Okay. Um he pretty much gifted it to me. He just gave it away because we're very close because we have a business relation. Okay. And so this is part of what is um a um a uh, chieftain's bed what chieftain okay a uh, okay. tulunadu chieftain's bed okay so what actually happens is uh, you in guttumani you have something called a malige okay and this is the first floor, floor okay. the first floor of the guttumani where your the main person of the uh, the, the chieftain uh, of the region let's say sleeps and so what happens is this uh, particular window has a shutter which is hinged to the bottom oh which can open up and becomes a bed so the chieftain sleeps on that bed and he gets the most ventilation in the house through this long window so this actually this would be the length of a bed okay so, so window and window. the bed were connected together back correct there. correct okay. so the shutter becomes the the bed of the chieftain oh yeah and so if in this i mean i found it um i didn't put it up because it's a chieftain's window okay. but uh, <laughs> it it of course is like the most important element yeah, yeah, yeah. of a guttumani 
True. So that is what it is. And uh, these are arches hmm. that are again very uh, indigenous to Tulu Nadu. My theory is of how they originated and mm-hmm. I might be completely wrong as well. But um, what happens in in a traditional home, mm-hmm. the structural system is actually based on columns. Okay. So what happens if you were to consider this to be a house, this is the column of a, a, a house. This would be the beam. Okay. And the way you support it is through these uh, elements called bodhige. Elements called? Bodhige. 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 Okay. And Bodhige is essentially, in technical terms, the capital of a column. Okay. So, I assume the way it developed probably is that, you know, if these were spaced apart, this wouldn't be an arch. Okay. But the moment you space a column close by and both the Bodhige's meet in the center, this turns out to be an arch. Mm. And there are examples of this in uh, Jain temples. Okay. And since we had a lot of Jain chieftains and Jain rulers true, in the region, true. I suppose this goes back to their... Hmm. Um, they have a lot of influence culture. on Tulu architecture. Absolutely, absolutely. And even they have an equivalent to Guttu Manera. It is called... It's uh, called... Uh, Bidu. Bidu. Yeah, Bidu. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's oh. one close by actually, hardly a kilometer from okay. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So yeah, before we guys dive uh, into greater detail, I want uh, my audience to warm up. Mm-hmm. So I have a trivia questions for them. There are three trivia questions and, uh, and there is a prize. The prize is half kilo brownie. Yes, guys, it's true. And <laughs> it's not just a regular brownie. It's a grizzly brownie. Okay. Oh. So uh, a, a bear yesterday, last night, when okay. I was researching the topic, knocked uh-huh. on my door. Really? Yeah. And uh, just, to, I mean... Uh, gave me half kg brownie <laughs> and i thought okay this is for the trivia that i suppose that just disappeared <laughs> yeah so so here it goes like uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether you get it right or wrong all you have to do is write your answer in the comments all right so the winner is the one who gets the most likes okay it doesn't matter what's right or wrong but the one who has the most likes So the first question is, what component in Tulu architecture is an example? It's highly influenced by the European influence. So there is a part in your home, like house, that is influenced by European style. And uh, to be more specific, to give you more clue, it was introduced by German missionaries in the 1860s. So what component do you think it is? That's the first question. The second question is, what is a four-lettered word? Is the name of these sloping roofs with wooden rafters and tiles that are characteristic of Tulu architecture? It's a four-lettered word. So that's the second question. And the third question is, what is the name of the central courtyard that serves as a multifunctional space for social, religious, and cultural activities in Tulu buildings? Yes, write your answer in the comments and I'll save you in one week. And by the way, uh, while you're writing your answers, but also make sure you uh, type your Instagram username if you have Instagram or uh, email ID so that we can contact you if you are the winner. Hey guys, if you like our content and if you would like to support us, please make sure you like, comment, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Okay, I got to know about Sampreet through my uh, mutual friend. Um, uh, his name is Subodh. So he's uh, constructing a house and uh, Sampreet uh, designed Subodh's home. So when he introduced me uh, to Sampreet, uh, he mentioned he specializes in Tulu architecture. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing this. I've never heard about Tulu architecture in particular. And... Uh, it suddenly struck my mind. I need to have a podcast with this guy. Yeah. And also I got to know that you are really, I saw your portfolio uh, surface, did not dig deeper. Uh, I saw, a, you know, style. Um, there's a lot of tradition. You infuse a lot of tradition in your design. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Tell me about your obsession about uh, Tulu architecture. Um, so I think it started with, um, let's say, uh, not as a rebellion, but in in a way where I'm trying to find my own roots, okay. or where I'm from. Mm-hmm. 
uh because i was born and brought up in bangalore but i'm natively from udupi and so when i mean i moved to udupi where my family decided that they had enough of bangalore as a city and i also got into manipal uh and as as i was doing my studies in manipal i was staying in this village that we are in today which is balladi which is in hebri and i never in my life have i lived in a village right so that change of context really is where uh, the entire story starts um what happened is i would go to my <laughs> college i would uh, do my it's a cosmopolitan town manipal is very cosmopolitan yeah. in that sense and uh, i would spend 8 hours 9 hours in manipal do an hours worth of driving back to my village and it's a completely different context you come back to this rural place with hardly any electricity uh, to go around very poor internet back then there was no 3g no 4g no nothing and so the only way you could really spend your time was to maybe walk around in the farm i i had my pets with me so i'd spend time with them and i had no neighbors a city is a very dense place but a village isn't you have very few neighbors uh, and i'm new to the place so this essentially i think helped me have this monologue with myself and i slowly started indulging in a lot of act- rural activities maybe it's going to the temples observing what my neighbors do look at the farming practices just observe the context around the trees the mountains the river and so that essentially uh, i think piqued my curiosity and eventually i kept going and visiting a lot of people in the village and in and around udupi for that matter since i'm in town now people know that i'm in town they would invite me and when i go there i would see all these old buildings beautiful mm-hmm. red oxide floors you know wooden beams and mangalore tiles and it's not that i had not seen it earlier but mm-hmm. now i'm seeing it as a architect. different perspective yeah and and i go back so i have this for 3 4 hours in a day I have 8 hours where I go to Manipal where I'm influenced I've been I'm getting exposed to a lot of modern architecture which has to do with Bauhaus which has to do with Walter Gropius uh Mies van der Rohe you know his Franz Werth house and all these different uh, examples so I'm really there's this dichotomy there's this sort of two wolves thing happening where you one side you have the whole modernistic approach that influence that that's coming through in my college and then i come back to this rural place where hardly any of those things matter you know and people are living a very different life to what has been showcased in the in the education system so i i one was the dichotomy but one was also that whole sort of imbalance that i started seeing that a lot of the education has to do with uh, how urban places are built and not so much to do with how rural places are being designed and built and you know mm-hmm. that sort of a thing and and for the most part i guess what what really struck me was most rural uh, most of rural india is just left to fend for themselves and they are using their own indigenous techniques to build their homes true right so that when i saw that i i saw this whole disparity and i think that's what piqued my interest in tulu architecture and what it is and of course it had to do with my whole exploration of my roots as as a sort of parallel to that mm-hmm. so i kind of researched and found that uh, tulu architecture kind of began from 580 mm-hmm. uh can you uh, walk us through how it has evolved over time and uh, sure. how it is in the present situation sure sure uh see i personally believe architecture is as much uh, a response to context Uh, than anything else right and uh, what how uh, a shelter is built is it's a response uh, I, and i believe and that's where my studio name comes in which is neralu uh, which i believe or can also in extension mean shade and in extension shelter and that's the whole point of architecture it's about building a shelter for people and so when uh, you know when you say the origins of tulu nadu architecture the the purpose is the same it mm-hmm. is to house people it is to house the functions of the people but what are those what are the functions that the people are the activities that the people are in, indulging in mm-hmm. that is where we need to go that actually has to do with the culture of the place 
So the culture then is influencing architecture. So I would assume, and and this is of course not a factual sort of thing, but my observation rather, uh, the activities and culture of a place starts stemming from the geological context of the place. What is the soil type that you have? What is the rainfall you have? What is the temperatures you're dealing with? What is the water source you're dealing with? You know, these sort of, infl- and what are the materials that are available? The rainfall. The rainfall. Uh, what are the uh, different ways you can use the materials that are available in and around you? So when it started, and it didn't start off, of course, with Mangalore tiles or industrial materials of any kind, it had to do with natural materials uh, such as river bed stones mm. that you would find, you know, in the in the smaller Tude that they call yeah, in Tulu. Yeah. Uh, it could be the timber that you have in the forests. We are very close to the Western Ghats. So you have a hell of a lot of timber available. Then you have muli, which is a certain kind of grass that you find in the okay. region. Uh, and we have a lot of grasslands. And grasslands are essentially why we have the water source we have today. Mm-hmm. And so they would occasionally in a year go to these grasslands, harvest the, the particular type of grass called muli bring it back to do their thatch roofs. Mm-hmm. Then you have coconut trees and po- coconut palm leaves that they would use, they would weave together to make partitions. So they would look at all these materials. That is one aspect of a building. Then the, there is the aspect of planning. How do you plan? Mm-hmm. Uh, you see, it's rain. Like you mentioned, we deal with a lot of rainfall. We are, we're looking at about 3000 to 4000 mm of rain today. It, which could have been a lot more in 560 mm-hmm, or so, mm-hmm. like the 6th sixth, sixth, uh, century. So uh, automatically, we cannot build flat slabs. We have to build with sloping roofs because you want the water to drain away. So there is a certain structure that's coming into place automatically, that which is to do with the climate. Then there's the aspect of heat. You have way too much sunlight in the summer and people are, need refuge so as much as a home is a place to live, it's also a refuge from these uh, climatic aspects of rain and heat and all that sort of a thing. So you need to protect yourself. So automatically this sloping roof becomes an umbrella against the rain and against the heat of the area. So you have the slope, you have the material that we spoke of, which is muli, which is timber, all that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. So you automatically have start getting a certain shape in place. Mm-hmm. right? So the roof is the most important aspect of any Tulunadu home, a Tulunadu building, so to speak. So it starts with the roof. Then uh, there is a certain limitation to the span of the roof that you mm-hmm. can have with the timber. So trees, when back then you didn't have a lot of tools. Right, sixth century, you had hardly any tools. You would have metal tools, but you have to physically cut trees down, chop them, shape them, all that sort of a thing. So they wouldn't go cutting down large trees. They're actually working with smaller girth trees, which are probably about nine inches Mm -hmm. or so, or a feet maybe at the max. Uh, And then they bring it. So it's called bulg. The the Tulu word is bulg. 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 Okay. So they bring these timber posts. Bulgs are nothing but timber poles that you see today as casuarina poles. Mm -hmm. So they would bring these and then they would start putting them together. And you get this particular reed here, which is a creeper that you find in the in the forests. So they would cut down those reeds to make it into a rope to tie these rafters and purlins and all of those elements together. But you have a limitation to how long these bulgs can be because you didn't have transport either back then. So you had to. So these logistics also play a part in how the architecture shapes itself. So let's assume probably there are about 10 to 14 feet of bulgs available. So then you automatically you have a roof. You have a limitation to the dimension of the roof. And that's that's pretty much it. Right. So that starts influencing the size of the house. That there is a certain limitation to how wide the house can be. So then uh, I would assume it starts with one shala. Somebody put together a roof and four walls. Hmm. Then the family grows. You, you have a family of four in a matter of the 25 years. That family of four becomes six. That family eventually in the next 50 is going to become a family of 12. You know, you never know. And 
mind you back then a family would have a lot of kids yeah, for one yeah. couple <laughs> right so it's it's i mean that you you can imagine the exponential growth in a family's size mm-hmm. and that would mean the house also has to accommodate this family yeah so they would have to incrementally build sh- more shalas so the ekal shala would become dushala and trishala and chaturshala so that essentially i believe is how the courtyard homes came about in the first place it's not to, i mean today they talk about the whole passive architecture where it cools the place and all of that but it happened on its own it wasn't mm-hmm. intentional there was a limitation to the material mm-hmm. there was a limitation to the logistical part of it and that sort of a thing gave birth to tulunadu architecture and of course when you have a family and and the whole intention of a house is security and shelter mm-hmm. you would want uh, to have a secure space so it only makes sense to build the house in a square because if you start expanding linearly mm-hmm. one end of the house and the other end of the house becomes way too far if you look at the shala and okay. you start adding shalas parallelly mm-hmm. it becomes like a train bogey okay right and so that security aspect is not there you don't know what one member of the family in the other end is experiencing as opposed to the other it makes end. it too far too far and also not not much people contact right? yeah no communication, communication is happening so. and in a family communication is everything mm-hmm. so it only makes sense that they build it in a way where it's closer the shala is one shala is like this the other shala is like this another one here and another one here mm-hmm. so it has the smallest footprint also because the primary aspect of any uh, agrarian society is to have most land available for agriculture house is only a place to live where they probably would spend about 6 hours to uh, in the daytime i mean if you have 12 hours of daytime mm-hmm. you would spend about 3 hours in that daytime at home then you would spend the rest of the 9 hours outside in the farm working or moving around whatever so it only makes sense to have the smallest footprint possible so all of these influence each other right so once now you have the square house which is your tip, which is the plan that you have for a typical guttu house mm-hmm. now you can't then again there's a question of now the family is becoming bigger we have had examples of the where the family is 50 member there's a joint family of 50 members in it so we can't again build a big courtyard house it becomes illogical then they either do multi courtyard houses or they start stacking it up Okay. So you get then you start then the first floor starts emerging mm-hmm. that you have the maligay that I was mentioning and it's also now if there are 50 member house they have more agriculture land right to feed everybody they have a big house then they also have a lot of riches that they would have gained mm-hmm. over the years mm-hmm. right this is all hypothetical but of course with a 50 member house yeah they have enough labor in the house mm-hmm. itself uh, where you you can work and they're producing a lot of things. so the riches start accumulating so then the question of uh, either security and then then i think artistic expression starts coming in you have these people who built the house over the years start becoming patrons who are going to ask who are going to have carpenters who are building for them they are going to have masons building for them all these uh, different artisans and craftsmen in the area are getting uh, are getting paid in rice by the way there was no mm-hmm. concept of currency back then everybody gets either coconuts or rice paddy mm-hmm. that they grow over the uh, over the year or the last year so now they are being given chances to express uh, mm-hmm. the the beauty that they see in and around us like you mentioned i mean as you entered the place you saw yeah, yeah, how beautiful yeah. it was so there's a lot of natural beauty in our region and that is also one of the uh, things that influence architecture Hmm. when i say context the climate the context the materials all of these aspects are important um uh, that beauty also starts influencing them so you can see that there are a lot of flower that peop- the the carpenters are carving into the pillars to the beams to different aspects of the home hmm. so then you have a certain sense of uh, embellishment or decoration coming into play and that is very contextual to tulunadu so i i would assume this briefly speaking and i know i wasn't brief about this but uh, briefly speaking i would assume this is how tulunadu architecture evolved okay. from the 6th century to the 21st mm-hmm. century so there's a lot of uh, depth to it there's a lot of 
history to it and that's why we call it heritage right because yeah. uh, there, it's such a beautiful thing it's it's a carpenter who's seen a tortoise and he he designs uh, money uh, or or the simple chairs from the past that we used to use where we used to sit on the floor they would have a money and the carpenter goes ahead and designs a money in the shape of a tortoise mm-hmm. right that is beautiful that is him observing the nature around him and e- trying to emulate that beauty in the craft that he's doing and mind you he's not he's not going to get paid extra because he's done that he's only going to get paid rise every day not like unlike today today if you do something extra everything is money based if you do something more you get more if you do something less you get less but mind you back then it wasn't the case you do something beautiful or you do something ordinary you still get paid in rice which doesn't make a difference right for the family you probably only only extending your uh, stay at the chieftain's house other than that nothing else mm-hmm. so i don't really know what pushed the artisans to you know actually start developing beautiful things like beautiful objects like designing and producing beautiful mm-hmm. objects but whatever influenced them it's tremendously beautiful to me okay and when i look at that and then i look at um, you know what we are doing today where we i feel a building in a way which is going against nature we were talking about just a little while ago talking about designing buildings with nature where nature is influencing mm-hmm. what you're doing be it in the forms that you use being in the materials, materials that they that we procure being the logistics of it but today we are talk we are we're building in a way where it's completely against nature mm-hmm. like materials like concrete. materials you are you are doing mining and you are you are you know destroying mountains to build what you're building right and you you might not feel the heat of that all exchange between nature and humans but somebody else is at in some, some other point that mm-hmm. is never going to go away there is going to be an impact whether it's in your immediate context or somewhere else it doesn't matter but there is an ecological footprint mm-hmm. to the building that you're building as opposed to tulunadu architecture or let's not say just tulunadu any vernacular architecture across the world mm-hmm. is sensitive to the area it is in so that whole dichotomy is again i mean going back to the same point as earlier that whole dichotomy of how i was getting educated to how i was seeing people live in rural india that whole contra- contrast sort of was becoming more and more apparent to me mm-hmm. modernism is all all about no decorations no embellishments it has to be simple and simple is what's beautiful and all those aspects and i'm not completely against modernism right i like i told you i myself it's in some sense at heart i'm a modernist or a minimalist but uh, what happens to our identity then becomes mm. an important question but yeah i mean to answer your question that mm. probably is what the history of yeah uh, tulunadu architecture are, is we are in the midst of i mean presently it's a mixture of heritage and the modernism right correct okay. correct yeah so um so you do, do you need an ipad to explain the features of tulunadu architecture sure sure yeah yeah i can cool. i can do that okay so tell us about the key defining features of mm-hmm. uh, tulunadu architecture like mm-hmm. how it differentiates itself from the neighboring architectures like um, we have kerala architecture, kerala architecture yeah dravidian architecture correct yeah and uh, karnataka's uh, major architecture is uh, kadamba architecture kadamba, right yeah so yeah. how does it differentiate from these three neighboring architects so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what are the unique uh, key characteristic of uh, tulu architecture so what is most unique and what's the primary um, you know design that we start with is actually the roof okay as opposed to your typical buildings where you start from the ground and then move up yeah you have to actually design roofs first in tulunadu architecture okay. and come down okay That's so okay on the same way you're explaining the ipad mm-hmm. uh we also explore one more answer i mean one more uh question of mine that would be mm-hmm. can dissect the house mm-hmm. right from the roof mm-hmm. to ceilings to walls to doors to sure. windows to floor to sure. foundation many many other things sure and we also explained uh, about not just structure design 
component mm-hmm. and materials absolutely yeah. like uh, parts wise parts Begin okay yeah, great yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. we're let's, literally let's, building let's, the house in that yes case. super we'll yeah. start from the roof yes we'll start from the roof <laughs> so uh, what typically happens like i said is there's a limitation to the span of the roof okay right so we start with that aspect of it so let's say we have a certain building Mm-hmm. and whenever you do a roof it's always a rectangle okay. always that's because the way you, a roof works is that you have two walls on either side and then you have the roof getting spanned okay via that wall mm-hmm. right so mm-hmm. this is your primary dimension okay let's just say this is about 15 feet right so whenever you build a traditional tulunadu home first you need that limitation of how wide can the our rectangle can, okay. be mm-hmm. right so we now have that answer now we know that this is a, going to be about 15 feet then we start and move forward and we start placing our uh, spaces and that's where vastu comes in right okay. the, the spatial arrangement the spatial arrangement is uh very influenced uh, you know in terms of how it needs to be placed as per vastu and personally uh, the way i look at vastu is how it climatically responds mm-hmm. t- uh, to the area so uh, you have something called the aya that everybody talks about here of course aya so aya is is the certain part in a building where you are supposed to you know have all the important things of the house placed okay and when i say important thing it's your puja room it's your kitchen it's your a uh, living space and the master bedroom okay. so to speak how about right? treasury like a treasury <laughs> a master bedroom was is okay. a newer concept it mm-hmm. was actually a treasury earlier mm-hmm. right so uh, uh, it starts with that and uh, in vastu they also talk about a certain ratio to this aya so this by this is what you need to design uh, for for your particular horoscope mm-hmm. so it starts at that point but i like to look at it more so in the climatic aspect of it so uh, you always and always have the door to the north mm-hmm. in tulu nadu mm-hmm. right so let's just say this is the north of the plan right so we start with making a depression here now what happens is uh, the way the winds work in uh, tulu nadu is uh, you generally have them coming from the south west side which is from here okay right west south west is so you you can uh, scientifically they call it a wind rose diagram so every region has a weather station mm-hmm. and the weather station will have significant data through the year and of many years Okay. that it compiles and generates what is called a wind rose diagram and a wind rose diagram helps you understand where you have the most winds coming from and we need winds yeah either in summers it's too hot you have you need winds or in the in the rainy season it's too humid and you need winds mm-hmm. so ventilation is a very important aspect and especially so in a kitchen because today you have gas cylinders or gas stoves mm-hmm. but earlier you had firewood stoves and they generate a lot of smoke right the whole process of cooking yeah. there's a lot of smoke coming in and what you need to do with that smoke is you need to get it away from the house as soon as possible mm-hmm. so you need to place the kitchen in a space which is generally the south east corner mm-hmm. of the house and then have openings in a certain way where it actually gets gets exhausted from the house naturally mm-hmm. through natural mm-hmm. convection and for me this is what vastu means you are you are designing it very sensitive to the climate right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that is one aspect of it second aspect of it is why we place uh, our master bedroom where it is and this is more of a practical reason than anything else um uh, the thing is this portion of the house is also what re- gets a lot of the heat gain as well so okay. heat gain happens in the west and the south again right because heat gain through the day starts at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon where your sun is at the peak uh, and you have the most heat it's it, it it's at its highest level at that th- time in the day mm-hmm. and so that's generally when the sun is moving from west to east and you have 
uh, the sun hitting the walls from the south and the west. And the walls are heating up at this point. The wall and the roofs are heating up. And this space is going to get very hot. The bedroom. The bedroom. Okay. The master bedroom. And so that... So why was it, it placed in the place where... Why is that is the case is people never slept in the bedroom. It was never a bedroom ah, earlier. Okay. It was a treasury like mm. you said. And also sometime when they need privacy... Then privacy, they then they would use it. And that's in the evenings. Okay. And that is okay, okay. Because then you have no problem of heat gain. It's yeah, in the evening yeah. then. More so, it probably is more beneficial because it's warmer and the outside is cooler. Okay. So that helps. Mm -hmm. um, they used to sleep in the hall. Right? They used to sleep in the hall in what is called a chavadi. Chavadi, okay. So the open space, right? Semi-open spaces which are covered with a roof. Mm -hmm. But coming back to why that treasury was important in that location is when it's hot mm -hmm. and you were placing your paddy and mm -hmm. the treasury back then is your paddy that okay. you've grown in a year. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be the driest and a spot in your whole house. So mm -hmm. they would actually have this as a ugrana. Ugrana. What is ugrana? Ugrana is a place where you store your okay. paddy. Okay. So this becomes your ugrana. Mm -hmm. the, gra the, the, the granary store, so to speak. So this space then uh, becomes very important. And it's also, then later on, it's also called Kubera Mole because it is known, I mean, it is believed that Kubera, that's where Kubera sits. What is Kubera? It's Kubera is... Sorry, uh, who is Kubera? Who, uh, what, who is Kubera essentially is the head of the family. Okay. It's, yeah. I mean, uh, more uh, metaphysically, it has a different meaning altogether. Okay. But more in the sense of the house, it's the head of the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that space becomes most important for him as well because he okay. spends his time in the evening. So the heat is never a thing there, mm -hmm. but it's more to do with the security of the house, mm -hmm. security of the, of the granary. Uh, so there's that aspect. So that we've covered two spaces at the end, which is this mm -hmm. and which is this, which is the kitchen and the granary or the ugrana. Okay. So you are left with the central space, right? So mm -hmm. in a single shala home, mm -hmm. eka shala home, you also need a lot of living space, right? If, although the family might be small at that point, we still need a family space where they're yeah. spending, they're sitting, they're eating, they're sleeping probably. Uh, so that becomes the central space of the house. That is this portion. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can't have all our activities indoors in this area because it's very important to have climate comfort. And yeah. climate comfort in this area especially is to do with ventilation, well ventilated spaces where you have wind flowing over you. That is what and that is a fairly recent discovery that it's not to do with the shade aspect of a house, mm -hmm. but rather to do with how much wind flow is mm -hmm. let in. So it's very important to have semi-open spaces which are, which are covered uh, from up top through mm -hmm, a roof, mm -hmm. but your walls are not there. Of course, that doesn't mean we can have all our spaces completely open to the outside. Security is still an aspect that we need to address. So what generally happens is they divide the central living space mm -hmm. uh, by half, where okay. this becomes more of an internal area mm -hmm. called a padasale. Padasale. It's called a padasale. And then the outer area, which is called a chavadi. Which is open. Which is open. open. Mm -hmm. Which is open in the sense it's covered on top, but it, it is open to the north. Okay. And mind you, north is the coolest part in the entire house. In, in, uh, the, in the longitude and land, okay. uh, latitude of the zone that we are in. Uh, north is the direction where you have very little heat gain through the day. So, uh, and you can expect a lot of nice wind in that area as well. Mm -hmm. So, Chavadi then becomes an important aspect where people spend their time during the day. Because that is the coolest point. Mm -hmm. And there is a so whole social angle to that space because um, it's in a small town, in a small community, you know everybody. And there's that aspect where your neighbor is coming in, mm -hmm. having a chat with you. Uh, going about the daily, you know, okay. um, gossiping mm. and all of that. Or uh, might they might come down to do some agricultural activity. They might be doing some processing mm -hmm. of beetle, knee, uh, beetle leaf or beetle mm -hmm. nut, mm -hmm. you know, anything of that sort. So those sort it of... It is like a present day sit out, right? Yeah, present okay. day sit out or you can call it more of a present day living room. Okay. Essentially. Uh, so you have that uh, activity happening in that space. Now... Coming to that space itself, structurally though, you have two main beams that are running 
in this particular area right mm-hmm. because of the way the roof is spanned okay. so how do you support if you don't have a wall there and if you're try you know keeping that space completely open to the mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. how would you manage to you know uh, uh span, sort of support that particular beam then is uh, there are these two columns that are introduced which are called mundige kambas technically okay and they are also believed to be the dwarapalakas of the house okay right so the protectors dwarapalakas are the protectors of the house is the metaphor something yes so uh, dwarapalakas as the name suggests dwara is a door okay and uh, palaka is a guardian okay so uh, because that is the first uh, that is the most public area of the entire house right that particular chavadi is the most public area so uh, you know metaphorically you there is that whole aspect of uh, kannagudu mm. uh, where you have uh, you know you can there's like a sort of um what is the term i'm looking for i mean like drishti 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 yeah. that happens so dwarapalakas are essentially uh, uh, protectors against the drishti from okay, happening okay, okay. right uh, so that yeah. is one aspect of it and more structurally they are supporting uh, the entire roof hmm. on top of them so this is influenced also by, through people's beliefs beliefs okay. in the from the region mm-hmm. they are also believed to be a pair of brothers Mm-hmm, and what's mm-hmm. m- most interesting is they are designed almost in a way where how two brothers are no two brothers are equal correct yeah uh, they are not the same they have their own personalities they have their own characters and that aspect and it's so beautiful carpenters intentionally make both the columns asymmetrical oh wow yeah intentionally and that's something that you don't see today today everything needs to be the like mm-hmm, symmetrical yeah, there needs yeah. to be order and there are these principles of architecture mm-hmm. that are followed there needs to be harmony there needs to be all of that but intentionally if somebody is doing it uh, to mm-hmm. be asymmetrical and not be the same and you're trying to uh insist on imperfection that is something else yeah wabi sabi kind of it's thing. like a wabi sabi <laughs> thing and and honestly i actually do find a lot of parallels between japanese architecture and mm. tulnadu architecture so you have those two aspects of the um, the dwarapalakas and so uh, from this then comes a bit of social hierarchy that that used to exist earlier okay where you uh, have certain communities in the i mean for better or worse it, it was the reality back then mm-hmm. uh, that you had certain communities that you would allow to a certain space and there would be certain mm-hmm. communities that are not allowed to a certain space and it could be to do with communities it could be to do with how uh, close they are to that other person right in a social structure or a social circle sort of manner you either have a certain person if this is a person um you have this concept of proximix uh which would mean um uh, how closeness, closeness mm-hmm. uh there are certain areas around a person that you uh, let people uh, into right so the outermost is for the people who are not that close and mm-hmm. we still do that sort mm-hmm. of we still have that uh naturally instinctively that we do mm-hmm. there are certain people we keep a certain distance from there are certain people who are very intimate with us who are in our inner circle mm-hmm. and so this whole aspect of proximix then can be seen in our architecture, architecture in the planning where you have this external juggle where anybody and everybody is allowed where people are uh, you know given food if there's a lunch mm-hmm. and agrarian societies you would have a lot of labor yeah uh, on a daily basis coming into work on the farm so they'd come home for lunch so they would be seated in that jagali and you know they would be given food uh, or they can spend time there they can spend a leisure time they can s- sleep there and this sort of a thing mm-hmm. so that being one of the aspects there's also another aspect where if i take a certain section from the building mm mm-hmm. you would observe that the plinth of the chavadi is higher than that of the jagali what is jagali so the jagali is the space that i was talking about in front oh, okay so this space this space in front okay is the jagali right and then so uh, you have a social hierarchy in that sense where one can enter the jagali 
that is your outermost circle then you have the chavadi which is the mid mm-hmm. circle so mm-hmm. to speak then you have the padasale where the close where the people. most closest okay. people are allowed okay right uh, for the better or worse it it got en- t- tangled up with ho- the whole caste system mm-hmm. but uh, social hierarchy still exists you know not the ca- i'm not talking about the caste system but mm-hmm. i'm talking about the whole intimacy part yeah, of proximity uh, yeah proximity and in- intimacy Now, so that is one of the aspects they looked at and mm-hmm. they intertwined that with climatology in the sense how does it also respond at the same time to um how the climate is mm-hmm. so when you step uh, the plinth the jagali is in a lower portion uh mainly because you would want your roof to be as low as possible so that when you have really heavy gusts of wind mm-hmm. coming in you and you have rain you your rain would splatter in mm-hmm. and when you step this the water then doesn't come into the chavadi space so the chavadi is a protected space as opposed to jagali you know will getting a little bit more exposed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then ev- that is one aspect of rain then the other aspect of it is the sunlight if okay. you have sunlight coming in naturally the shadow that is cast is still the end of the chavadi so the chavadi is always in the shadow mm-hmm. the jagali might have little bit of sunlight through the day but you will never see sunlight in the chavadi space so there is very little heat gain mm-hmm. happening uh, in the chavadi space so that's also an architectural feature that you can you know see so you have the mundige kamba here then you have the wall here then you have the middle wall that is separating chavadi and, and the padasale. padasale okay and so then you look at what happens to this mid space because we are looking at a sloping roof mm-hmm. the tallest portion is in the middle of the house mm-hmm. so what they do is they introduce something called a muchige or technically ceiling. yeah you could call it a wooden fall ceiling okay so they seal the central portion up okay so you have some space left on top which is your attic okay. or atta mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which they used to say uh, store, store a lot of mm-hmm. uh, their agricultural black produce money. not Just black money. <laughs> <laughs> today yeah i'm sure they do but uh, let's call it uh, black gold as mm-hmm. they called it in history which could be pepper okay so they would uh, save pepper they would save arecanut a lot of the commercial crops would be saved in this space mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and interestingly enough the muchige uh, so if i were to draw another plan would be solid in the padasale area and the treasury area right but it would actually be perforated in the kitchen space oh okay which is called a kuttata kuttata okay right so uh, uh atta is an atta atta is attic i don't know why it's called kutta i don't know what that means okay but essentially how it is is you have a lot of slats that are running and you have no internal uh, uh planks so to speak so it's actually open okay in the kitchen so what happens is the smoke from the kitchen kitchen would go goes up. into yeah. the attic and that actually heats up the space mm. in the attic and it's also carbon right it's also yeah. soot that gets uh, deposited on all your agricultural produce and on the roof mm-hmm. so uh, there are two aspects to it one <coughs> is your agricultural produce you know being uh, safe and secure in the sense from insects and you know these other things mm-hmm. because if it's too hot you wouldn't expect any insects or rats or mice mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, to to come you know attack the produce and that generally is a concern for most agrarian societies more than anything else yeah. the human yeah. uh, issue is not so much of an issue for them then the second aspect is wood when it is smoked lasts longer okay right so you don't have termite attacks so the the major issue and mm-hmm. even today till today yeah termites you try to mm-hmm. yeah if you try to uh you know propose a mud structure or a wooden structure the first question is what about termites hmm. but that wasn't the case then because it was planned so well integrated into the lifestyle of the people where you have you have firewood you have smoke 
it can be either be seen as an opportunity or as a disadvantage back then they saw it as an opportunity uh-huh. they used that smoke to protect the the wood of the house Oh, so in that sense it it was you know it's dual purpose to the same space so these are the different aspects of what's it called again it's called a kuttata kuttata okay kuttata so these are the different aspects so you have you have uh, the mundige kamba you have the muchige you have the uh, as a space these are elements let's say uh-huh and then you have spaces which is the chavadi you have the jagali you have the padasale right mm-hmm. and then uh, kitchen uh, some people call it that but uh, it is also called adapil adapil mm uh-huh. right and uh, in adpil what also happens is um, you can draw on this side oh that's uh, why it's called adpil okay okay sorry. what 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 do you think uh, the place i'm from is called adpilla oh really oh yeah ah. i think uh, it used to be a big huge kitchen i guess Pelka. maybe that's quite possible ah, okay. yeah it's called an adpil <laughs> yeah yeah nice and uh, what also happens is Uh, as a home expands right okay. and this is a ekashala ek example that i gave you as a ho- uh, home expands uh you have the ugrana here you have the padasale here what also used to happen is they used to have two kitchens mm mm-hmm. and this also ha- uh, it depends on what community this belongs to and that sort of a thing but for the most part this is the most sacred area in the center the padasale and all of that So what would happen is this area uh, would have your more so regular cooking which is like you know your boiled rice and your kan- you know ganji mm-hmm. and all of that like your sambar and all of that but the preparation area if it's a you know meat eaters home if it's a non vegetarian home uh, they would have a lot of the meat preparation in this area mm-hmm. so you can see it in today's times what you have a dry kitchen and a wet kitchen concept mm-hmm. they had it then Mm-hmm. where the wet kitchen would be here and then the dry kitchen would be the interior space mm-hmm. and so what they what this also led to is that when you have the padasale in the center um uh, and you have the chavadi here mm-hmm. uh, they would close this portion off from the public but they gi- would give access to the uh, the secondary kitchen mm-hmm. the wet kitchen through the chavadi uh, through the chavadi or the jagali okay okay so if this is the case and this is let's say the chavadi right and you would have your ugrana here and uh, sometimes the chavadi goes all the way but sometimes it so happens your kitchen actually is still here right and uh, from the jagali one can actually enter into the bhojana shale mm-hmm. so it also worked as a bhojana shale which is your dining space mm-hmm. so here now it's incrementally growing your kitchen has become two kitchens that kitchen the secondary kitchen has expanded itself to a dining room mm-hmm. and then slowly they start adding another living room here okay uh sometimes it would be called the dharma chavadi okay uh where if it's a very important person uh then people would go to go to him and there would be some panchayat and that sort of a thing that happens mm-hmm. in that space so they would add another uh, living room there which is more public then this becomes semi public living room where the family spends their time so this becomes a drawing room this becomes a family room and i'm trying to correlate this all to like modern planning mm-hmm. uh because modern planning is still responding to the same human beings that lived in the 6th century right we might be technologically yeah, advanced yeah. but we still have the same social behavior and social behavior is what's most important when it comes to planning than anything else as as architects we tend to study people we don't really tend to study the technology that those no, people use people, right? you're building for the people so you're actually looking at their cultural values you're looking at their social values and these sort of things influenced what was done vernacularly and these this whole planning strategy has evolved right you're looking at as planning strategy 
like you mentioned if it's 500 6th century and we are in the 21st century we're looking at 15 centuries of development that mm-hmm. has happened in between right so you can imagine how they would have done a lot of trial and error and you know some things might work some things yeah, might not yeah. work but we end up with this so uh, again this would be our 15 feet span that you that we spoke of and this would be the 15 feet span and then the chavadi uh, the jagali would actually have a separate roof to it so if this is a ro- central roof you would have a separate rafter so there would be a joinery here Hmm. and they would have a separate rafter for that particular space and then you would have the level system that comes in there's a whole lot of intricacy right because today we've i'm probably simplifying it but there might be n number of factors that were considered when they were designing a space so you can imagine we spent quite a lot of time mm-hmm. on this question but yeah. you can imagine how complex Hmm. this piece of architecture is i'm only talking about a ekashala house imagine Correct. how complicated it might turn out to be if it's a chaturshala house where you have cow sheds coming into play hmm. you're talking about bigger granaries you're talking about more rooms you're talking about puja room you're talking about so many other aspects Correct. so you walked us into the uh, spatial arrangement of yeah. uh, uh, tulu architecture yeah so let's break it down Mm-hmm. Uh, let's start from the roof. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about the materials that were used mm-hmm. uh, and the uh, structure of sloping and uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the roof. Mm-hmm. Then we'll come down to ceiling. Mm-hmm. Then we'll come down to the walls. What mm-hmm. is the materials they used mm-hmm. uh, and the structure of doors and windows and how did they support the roof? Roof. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about uh, the foundation. Mm-hmm. I will talk about that uh, one by one. Let's talk, start with the roof. Roof, yeah, sure. So, like I said, uh, roof generally has to do is always timber. Right? Okay. It's today they, they use GI, they use MS. Again, it's a question of termites. Okay. But the principally, it's still the same. The, okay. the logic of it is still the same. So, general, there are uh, um, all carpenter, and here in traditional homes, it's very important. um to have the carpenter the right carpenter right mm-hmm. you didn't have architects in the 6th century or earlier i'm just talking about the earlier vernacular homes it was the carpenter who was designing the entire house right you had a concept of a stapati but it was more so for temples it was mm-hmm. a carpenter who would decide what is the house how big would it be and all of that so he would have something called a kolu okay and this kolu uh differs in sense he would use that as a measuring tool because there was no imperial or metric system then so they had their own system of measurement using that kolu and then they would have angula and uh, they would have into angula roof they would have a 10 angula roof there is 12 angula roof so they would generally for a temple they would do a 12, 12 angula roof and when i say angula there's a certain proportion to it frankly i've spoken to a couple of carpenters i never understood how they actually measure it but there's a certain uh, geometry in place they never had I, I, pythagoras theorem and all of that that we study today mm-hmm. but they had their own sense of geometry that they used to have so they would divide the base by 3 they would divide the the opposite side by 3 they would take a right angle they would connect this or they would connect this and this sort of a thing right so this actually decides the different angles in which the roof uh-huh. uh would need to be and when it's a temple they do a 12 uh, 12 angula uh roof which is essentially uh for our understanding 45 degrees right and then you would have a end hatu angula roof which would essentially be a 40 degree okay so what's the difference in the angle it, the slope the slope okay. it, it differs and then uh you would uh at the end have an end to angular roof right um which is a 35 degree slope right so this would be taller and this would be very tall and when i when i say very tall automatically these uh become more complicated the rafters this okay. is the element that decides the slope of a roof right mm-hmm. so they either become lengthier or they become shorter or you know based on the angula or the angle in which the roof is placed 
so of course in a temple you can afford to you have enough money and you have enough resources that is being spent on a temple to identify the right tree and you know have the longest rafters possible and all of that so then you can go for a 12 angula roof but if it's a if it's a small home for a average person you're trying to look salvage as much as you can from your context within a radius of 5 kilometers so uh so they generally go, go with the a n to angle roof or a 10 angle roof and this is all based on trial and error right so uh the smallest roof still can manage the downpour that we get in terms of rainfall uh it can it can with withhold <laughs> that much amount of uh water coming in on top of the roof so that is the aspect that decides that is the first aspect that's decided in in a uh, uh, roof <laughs> the slope of the roof the second aspect of it would be the uh, the aya i was talking about so the aya essentially um, you know decides the span of the roof so uh, this would have today they talk about profit and loss i'm not sure i i've never related that to my practice per mm-hmm. se but there's a certain proportion that it uh, that emerges from uh you know how they study a uh, horoscope and all that sort of a thing so according to this aya and when you combine that with the whole angula aspect of it you automatically end up with a certain length of rat- rafter that's required mm-hmm. and that is the first thing that's identified b- before building the house they actually go with the carpenter go to the forest identify the tree look at the girth look at the height and then decide okay with this tree we can produce this rafter length of rafter and uh, then that is the one that we are going to use so they are going to cut the tree down they would let it season over a year or two in the river they would put it they put the logs lumbering or something yeah yeah they would lumb they, they would cut the timber down mm-hmm. they would let it season in the river outside i mean there are rivers right yeah. we generally in a village we are very rich in terms of number mm-hmm. of rivers we have so that would help the wood season and and then based on that now they have decided on what the span is they then speak to the mason and mm-hmm. say listen this is the span we have decided this is where the walls are supposed to come mm-hmm. and the walls are generally uh Uh, so the carpenter decides the the plan okay. the the size of the house the plan is anyways a vedic okay. plan it depends on the grid of the uh, mm-hmm. the mandala so they there some there's an aspect of an 8 by 8 mandala or a 16 by 6 mandala and these are uh, vedic calculations that are used to determine uh, what uh, the plan is going to be mm. right so there would be the central square which you cannot build uh which is uh, where it is believed is the brahmanabi or the the center of the universe so to speak so the it, this actually follows the cosmic model um that they scale down to the level of a house which is very complex but mm-hmm. uh based on which uh, you know the mason already knows what the plan is going to be so they never actually had any of like today how we practice is a very drawing intensive industry but then there was no concept of drawings at all so the mason knows where spaces need to come but he just needs to understand what the span of the roof is going to be so he can build the walls accordingly place the walls accordingly mm-hmm. so the roof so then the uh, carpenter and the mason have a chat and then they decide this is where it's going to get built and uh, generally uh, like i said they don't build uh, you know in a arable land in the sense where they can actually have crops growing so they identify the the most useless piece of land generally mm-hmm. which today here we call good day right that is a form of land that we have the mm-hmm. typology of land that you have they identify good day because you have rocks also in a good day so they can use that to build the foundation and it's the least arable land also so they are not eating into the agricultural uh, land mm-hmm. uh so they identify that they identify the highest spot also in the in the area and build there so that in case of a flood and paddy you are mm. depending on a river so there's a good chance if ever there is a flood you don't want your house to be you know in danger because it is built out of mud 
right so there is that limitation so they take into consideration the material mm-hmm. that's being used and try to protect it as mm-hmm. far as possible mm-hmm. so um let's you, come back to the roof the roof <laughs> so roof is done okay and okay. Uh, so based on the roof now the mason has had a chat with the carpenter oh okay and he is going to now build the walls now the mm-hmm. walls are generally made out of mud okay no uh, stones m- uh, sorry no stones okay uh stones only came after i think mm-hmm. and I've, i might be wrong here mm-hmm. but uh, it only came into place after we had transport because stones mm-hmm. you need quarries yeah right and where are quarries are far off from your piece of land where you're trying to build mm-hmm. so the closest material that's available to you is the paddy the the mud from the paddy fields mm-hmm. which is very clayey so they would actually stabilize that with a little bit of sand and you can you can use that okay. that material mm-hmm. laterite stone or laterite which is the pri- which is now today the primary mm-hmm. material locally, that's being used locally available stone. but primarily used it has to be quarried out of a piece of land and yeah, it, it yeah. that was very labor intensive yeah. right uh, and with no transport it is mm. close to impossible to bring that much material to mm. build a house So traditionally they always use mud because that made logistical sense yeah, yeah. Uh, to build with. So you, they would make either walls like this which mm-hmm. are tapered what which are called cob walls. Okay, interesting. Right? So they would actually make mounds of earth mm-hmm. and then they start stacking it on top of each other like almost smacking it uh, mm-hmm. together. Okay. And then they would build a wall. They would shape like much like how a potter would shape um a piece of Correct. pottery mm-hmm. they would shape a wall up and uh, that whole smacking process is important so there is enough compaction so there mm-hmm. is enough strength in the wall to mm-hmm. hold the entire roof stru- uh, together so there would be it would be sufficiently thick enough mm-hmm. so you are looking at almost walls which are about 2 feet thick Correct. as opposed to today we are where you are working with 9 inches wall mm-hmm. they are working with 2 feet thick Sound walls soundproof walls soundproof <laughs> walls <laughs> thermal insulation yeah, very yeah, high thermal yeah. insulation breathable also breathable also right okay. it's mud it's yeah, it's yeah. very uh, porous in that in its nature mm-hmm. so they would stabilize this with um, the, it wouldn't be sufficiently sticky enough mm-hmm. you need the material to become cohesive and homogeneous mm-hmm. so they would actually ferment this uh earth so okay. they would bring earth so let's say there's a mound of earth that they bring and they stack it up mm-hmm. and then they start adding jaggery to this right uh, okay. so jaggery was something you could find earlier what's the purpose of jaggery adding to the mud uh, that's because you, one is the sweetness will help the f- earth ferment okay and it will also introduce stickiness to the soil because okay. soil on its own is not sticky enough to become cohesive mm-hmm. so you need a binder so mm-hmm. the binding agent becomes jaggery and jaggery was available here sugarcane was being mm-hmm. grown here at at some point in time that was very innovative right yes yeah. that was that is again they are using something that's locally available but mm-hmm. then they understand that this isn't sticky enough so add some mm-hmm. material which is sticky very sustainable looks very sustainable <laughs> it's grown locally yeah, it's yeah, an agricultural yeah. produce mm-hmm. and another agricultural produce they would use either muli mm-hmm. which is that grass i was talking about so to actually chop it up and they add it as a uh, kind of reinforcement mm. not the reinforcement you would think of Got which it. is your Got steel it. reinforcement steel. today but rather it helped uh, keep the mud together from cracking mm. because you would have seen when earth when there's a drought in a place you would see the uh, the immediate image there's you would have is the mm. cracked earth mm-hmm. that you would see and when there's enough uh, there isn't enough water and when earth cracks it is very uh, malleable in a sense very expansive mm-hmm. it can expand contract based on how much moisture there is so if you don't add some uh, stabilizing uh, material mm-hmm. such as muli or they used to use i believe also rice husk okay again an agricultural waste mm. that they add into the walls and that would stabilize the entire uh, wall got it right so they would they would add all of these things and they would let it ferment over time and then they would stack it up either using cob walls or which is which was i think most predominant and less labor intensive mm-hmm. or make into sun baked bricks mm. so they would so every household every traditional household 
that you would see would have these uh, molds, which is what you can see up there. So that is a mold of an adobe brick. Okay. So any household, so whichever, wherever I go to an old home, I raid their attic because that's where they keep all the old stuff in the mm-hmm. house. And you will find this particular mold so that the they brick make the brick, brick making. Brick. Every household has it because that was a mm. that is something that they used to do, right? They and have plenty of time. Plenty of time. If they are building incrementally over a certain period of time, it it made yeah. sense to have that mold in the house itself. Oh. Nice. Right. Looks nice. Yeah, so you Sounds would have nice. you would have that mold, and they would use essentially the same material. They would compact it within this, and they would remove the mold and let it um, dry. Dry. So these are called sun baked bricks, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or uh, you, alternatively, it's also called adobe bricks. Okay. Right. So adobe bricks. So y- they use the same clays that of the paddy field. Same. Okay. Same material is the same. It's just a the form is form different. is different. Okay. So they would bake it so it makes it more uh, hard. It has more strength to mm-hmm, it uh, mm-hmm. probably, and then they would uh, build it with the same uh, scenario that we build it today with mud mortar and mm-hmm. the things that they would have. So why is that tapered and? the walls so the walls are tapered because of structural reasons so if you build a mud mo- mound mm-hmm. if i mean imagine a ant hill which is straight you mm-hmm. can't you wouldn't even think about it or imagine a mountain why is a mountain the way it is mm-hmm. right it's because the higher you go the weaker it is mm-hmm. and the more load there is so if i take another sheet so let's say you have you build like this right the lowest portion has the highest amount of material sitting on top of it so there's a lot of dead weight right of the material itself uh-huh. forget about the roof and all of that just the sheer dead weight is too much for it to bear and it's it's not stable like these edges will just collapse uh-huh. because you are working with gravity right so the the best way for you to work against gravity is to have this form which wherein the higher you go the lesser the material <coughs> the lesser the load the dead weight so automatically the, uh, it shapes up to be in this manner mm-hmm. and could also have logistical reasons because the higher you go uh, you have to carry that material to that height yeah. right so if you have to carry more material uh, it is difficult and it's more laborious right Good. So that is the way the walls are built. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are they are stacked up either as adobe bricks mm-hmm. or they are stacked up as cob walls. Mm-hmm. The cob actually have balls they make, and you yeah. that is I don't know it could be a thing that they saw that potter wasps, which are here, which is again indigenous to the area, actually do that. If you see bio inspired, it could be bio inspired, could be biometric in that mm-hmm. sense. I mean, um, yeah, so could be. Yeah. So let's get back to the walls like so, uh, anything so, in the walls like uh, So th- those are the materials that you know okay. go into a wall and then there's something called a wall plate which holds the rafters together Okay so you wall plate the, is a wooden material it's a wooden material so if you have the walls and if it's flat on top <coughs> you have a wall plate here you would have the rafter sitting on top of it and you have a lot of joinery mm-hmm. uh in these rafters so you would have a ridge piece on top you would have purlins to hold if it's a mangalore tile you would have purlins even otherwise you would still have purlins mm-hmm. if if this is let's say either palm or if it is uh, muli in either case you still need so this the way it works in plan If is, they use the palm like leaf, did they make it water resistant or something? They would make it very thick, so okay. they would stack it on top of each other till mm. uh, one palm leaf, you know, is covering the voids in the other palm leaves. Mm-hmm. So that was the best way they could. Uh, but it's not really watertight. Mm-hmm. It, it does. You would end up having a little bit of water come in. Yeah. But it's so thick mm-hmm. that eventually, uh, by the time the water reaches the bottom, mm-hmm. it would have. you know um exited the roof got it so one or the other palm leaf is going to take care of the water mm-hmm. is that was their best bet that they could do 
so yeah i mean that is what it was and they would build the foundation using river stones which today has become a problem because in the sense old homes that are built using river stones they tend to collapse because river stones are very smooth right very mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they have no edges because they were in the river water used to flow over them yeah and when you place river stones together there is hardly any friction between them and that was the best stone that was available probably in a lot mm-hmm. of the homes um so today that has become a structural issue where the foundations are giving way and that's why a lot of people decide to just do away with old homes and mm-hmm. you know build the more modern so to speak stronger mm-hmm. materials but mm-hmm. these buildings actually last 300 years mm-hmm. more modern homes even banks guarantee only 50 years of life so and that is the foundation that is a wall and that is the roof and that makes your mm-hmm, entire mm-hmm, structural shell of a house then how do you make the floors either you do it in mud compacted mud and then you would finish it off on top using uh, uh, you would you know kind of rub over it and make it smoother mm-hmm. or later on eventually they got oxides Okay. that were available but oxides are again after industrialization pre industrialization mm-hmm. you didn't have oxides what are oxides oxides are basically the, like a paint or something not paint they're actually byproducts of uh, metal industries okay so it is ferric oxide if for example red oxide is nothing but ferric oxide so um, that is it is it has a certain color to it a tinge to it that is added to cement and then applied over uh, earth mm-hmm. which uh, technically is not traditional but it's become part of a traditional home traditionally i would think it is mainly mud floors that were there if not cow dung would be smeared over mm-hmm. the floor mm-hmm. as a material there were no use of paint or such no no paint okay. the maximum they would do is have lime mm-hmm. and they would add a certain additive like the local earth okay uh, to give it some color mm-hmm. and later on post industrialization you had batteries i believe so okay. they would old batteries in the house they would like they would crack it open and the zinc within they would use and uh, mm-hmm. have this black paint that they would use to yeah Good. they did not use even the marbles or granite the marble and granite <laughs> was never a concept <laughs> all post industrialization yes. these all these materials are post industrialization mm-hmm. or the 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 more humble materials are all pre industrial and all of whatever the basic logic is if it's available within your context and when i say within your context without transport it's hardly mm-hmm. a kilometer mm-hmm. with the transport you can look at 5 to 10 kilometers if not i'm not talking about like lmvs yeah 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 I'm talking about bullock carts maybe 5 mm-hmm. 5 kilometers at the max and no roads back then mm-hmm. to transport your materials so easily today you have trucks and you have jcbs and mm-hmm. earth movers and you know name you uh, 3d printers yeah it's 3d printers <laughs> maybe could be a future yeah. future of it i'm I actually mean, talking to somebody about people in uh, 50 years would say Uh, today we have 3d printers additive manufacturing yeah. back then we used to carry in trucks <laughs> and trucks <laughs> and absolutely could be the case mm-hmm. but uh, yeah i mean those sort of logistical things influence how it's built mm-hmm. so there's so many layers to this right there are cul- there's a cultural layer to it there's mm-hmm. a social layer to it yeah. there's a logistical layer to it all mm-hmm. of these things uh, only go it only goes to show that vernacular architecture or tulu architecture was so advanced mm-hmm, for its mm-hmm. time in the sense today it's seen as something that is um, how would you put it um, like meager or it's it's not really advanced mm-hmm. as opposed to rcc or something else i'm not saying rcc isn't advanced but the way we are using it is just sheer waste of material you know the end. because slabs rcc slabs tend to expand and crack to because mm-hmm. of the heat that we have today in the summers and it's only getting worse by the day as we know with climate change and and we have tremendous amount of uh, rainfall and all of this affects slabs very mm-hmm. badly it makes it it cracks up it lets water in and you would i, I would assume about 80% of homes which have rcc slabs always end up leaking and you will always end up seeing some metal roof on top of it that they built to protect the house so at the end of the day you are coming back to your roots because that was 
it made sense to do it <laughs> so why not do it right from the beginning is what i thought and that's why that's how that whole process of my practice started that okay there are certain problems in terms of mud having you know uh, being a material which can have termites in them or could house uh, rats and things like that in oh. them uh, but if we sufficiently stabilize it enough Mm-hmm. we can actually work with it uh, we can actually take it forward we are not i don't know why we are not interested in upgrading our vernacular and taking it forward okay. we are very excited to leave everything behind in the pursuit of hmm. modernism do you have any ideas to make uh, rethink of using mud as a material actually um i personally it's not something that i'm thinking of but the industry is already doing it you oh, have it? you have cement stabilized earth blocks where oh. they're using 5% cement to stabilize earth just 5% just 5% and the rest of it is, is earth all ma- earth, earth. Yeah. but they they're using technology that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of uh they have these machines that they add uh, earth into and okay. they compress it hard enough okay that it it gains enough strength okay uh, to accommodate a lot more uh, load it can it can take a lot more load than your regular cob and adobe walls mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so the industry there's like a hybrid system i okay. would say there is the middle path i understand that we can't be puristic and say hey let's all go back to living the way mm-hmm. we were we had thatch roofs it, it was beautiful we can't do that uh, at least i don't believe that's the right approach to things because if we mm-hmm. are moving forward in whatever you want to define that uh, as you know mm-hmm, moving mm-hmm. forward uh if we are developing as a civilization you mm-hmm. will end up with upgradations and it is part of the whole trial and error yeah method yeah. so it only makes sense to adapt technology that you have invented mm-hmm. and uh, come up with a middle path a hybridization let's say of uh, our vernacular haven't you thought about mud 3d printer <laughs> I have in fact I'm actually going to explore that very soon. Oh is it? I'm talking okay. to somebody. Guys if you are an engineering student or something <laughs> uh, you can collaborate maybe right? Absolutely absolutely. I I am trying to reach out to somebody who's trying to do 3D printing in India at the moment. Okay. uh we're still and uh, you know yeah still, everybody has tried concrete 3d printing concrete. nobody has tried yeah, uh, yeah earth 3d mud 3D printing. i believe yeah, there yeah. somebody has it's it? it not in india but i i believe they have tried it in uh, france if i'm not wrong okay yeah so france i believe has an earth institute um and all oh that one looks like uh like uh, uh, like an anthill yeah anthill, yeah yeah anthill, yeah, yeah, anthill, yeah so they have tried it uh, and again it's i think stabilized earth if i'm okay, not wrong okay. but it's I, it looked nice actually I yeah. mean, i it was one year back i guess oh okay, yeah, okay i saw i mean when i saw it okay yeah absolutely i mean there are there is that whole exploration happening and i'm very hmm. um, you know excited to see yeah, what's going yeah, to come out the, of it how tulu architecture will adapt the modern technology yes and, we, and it's high time we do that future, yeah. correct correct we it's high time we do that because nice. it's only been about i think 40 years or so that we've adapted all these so called modern technologies to yeah. building our homes until then we were humble enough to be sensitive to our to our world yeah. natural world so how do you imagine it to be like uh, there is the input thing which is uh, dug into the ground yeah. so it yeah. excavates the yeah. earth and it turns it into into yeah, our homes home, but like, yeah. uh, we could look at strategies which have the least amount of impact mm-hmm. whatever we dig into can become sources of water storage mm, true you know yeah. things rain water like, harvesting rain water harvesting and all of that so mm-hmm. there is this whole system of uh, cradle to cradle okay right and if you want to be uh, net zero carbon uh, you know uh, building then you have to look at using materials that go from cradle to cradle mm-hmm. uh, so cradle uh, essentially is like from the birth to another birth in okay. the sense uh, when a material is born there's a lot of energy that is used uh but uh as you move on there are there's a lot of waste also being the, you know in the process that you know is born mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. how do you try and use that material to make new materials mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the waste materials and make new materials and so we have to approach it in that sense and i 
there's a lot of people doing some very interesting work yeah i think we drifted far far away but yeah. i'm glad yeah. it's yeah. interesting conversation i think we missed on doors and windows there yeah so doors and windows uh, are again timber okay uh, the way they were designed though are were very interesting so uh, earlier there was no concept of views and vistas that it, it wasn't a thing where people used to sit used to think about how we would see that particular tree outside mm. from my bedroom so would that mean i need to have this large piece of glass that I, nobody had the time and nobody had the interest that wasn't the uh, way we lived everybody mm. was busy. everybody were outside and not were inside and uh, yeah <laughs> exactly and when it was a place of refuge you didn't want to see oh. the outside there was no reason for you to do so because the activity you would come home to is either have food or sleep mm. it's it's more of a refuge for you than anything else today it's not that i mean today you spend a lot more time in your homes through the day and especially with work from home post covid you're at home all the time yeah so there uh, is a lifestyle change so today they talk about larger openings and mm. things like that uh larger openings are something that's essential i believe uh it the technology back then didn't allow us because if it's timber and let's imagine uh we are building this huge mud wall mm mm-hmm. and if you need to make a puncture in the wall oh okay you had so much of earth that had to you know yeah. sit on top of this tiny little window great load right a lot of load mm-hmm. so it never allowed for larger openings okay, okay. as opposed to today where rcc has been has been introduced where you can introduce something called a lintel and that can take the load and transfer mm-hmm. it down so their technology is is brilliant i mean that's where you need to use rcc yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but it didn't allow for it earlier so what and it they never needed it either so they did smaller multiple openings so if this is a typical opening mm-hmm. uh what they would do is one is it would be far lower in the ground so this would be uh hardly about 2 uh, feet or so mm-hmm. because uh a person would end up sitting on the floor there was no concept of furniture back in the day yeah and that's where you need wind right when you're sitting down mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so all the windows are lower first of all and second of all you had to manage the glare because as i mentioned if this is a typical home you had for the most part windows towards the south mm-hmm. and south you had a lot of sunlight wind. okay sunlight, sunlight. so you still needed the wind but you didn't want the sunlight mm-hmm. and so what automatically happened is they introduced something called bannati gates what bannati gates okay so if i were to sp- no, 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 spell no. it out in bannati gate right mm-hmm. so these would be these square pegs that were designed in a way to increase the air flow so if you take a typical section of a window mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this would be our window this would be our frame right and a bannatige would be in this particular fashion hmm and there's art in it there is art in it there's also technology in it because mm-hmm. when the wind comes in it is you know pushed in and then released so in engineering this is how a valve works this is how we literally reach the moon <laughs> right uh, it it is how they inject fuel into a rocket and then burn it when they do this there's so much force that is produced as you may know as area increases pressure increases mm-hmm. and then when you burn it at this point and it the, the thrusters mm-hmm. are essentially designed to increase the to maximize the force so imagine the same concept but with wind so when the when it enters the house mm-hmm. there's an increase in speed yeah. as it enters the house so when you when you blow through a smaller uh, hole on the other side you have a far greater velocity so it was designed to be like that and also you would break up the sunlight hmm 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 so you essentially this would be shadow if the sunlight is coming straight through th- there would be shadow here right but 
uh, at the same time you have a greater velocity of wind so even at that level they've actually engineered the windows to suit our climate mm. so these are how the windows typical windows of tulunadu would be then uh, there are the doors so the doors would be a far shorter actually there, mm-hmm. there are certain reasons they i've heard of which are that yeah they are shorter right they were far shorter mm-hmm. and i think uh, one of the reasons i heard was that um, it is essentially for you to be respectful of where you <laughs> live where you bow down before you enter okay and uh, always i have seen the main door would have some sort of uh, carving in this particular area okay i've seen as far as people having certain uh gods or goddesses yeah. carved into this particular doors are the most artistic uh, component of home, of right? the end tulu homes yes of tulu homes like yeah a lot of carvings a lot of carvings okay. and things like that and of course that is the main i mean it is the only way to enter a house right so that mm. also ha- happens to be the most uh secure that is one point secure system okay. that you have for the entire house it can't be compromised so they would use larger sections of wood for it they use, they would use the best sections of wood for it because it can't be compromised mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for three generations because this is being built for three generations in one shot so they would have one that aspect of you bowing down before you enter and it's probably a more cultural thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. other than this there is a certain form factor to it where you have what are called uh, i mean carpenters across tulunadu call it different names they call it kai they call it this will be like in the shape of uh, a naga mm-hmm. like a cobra snake so you would have a similar sort of a design here and uh, uh naga is something that's very revered in this area right they're mm-hmm. very respected and feared creatures that they're they're actually called guardians of tulunadu they're believed to be myth- mythically speaking so i assume they are also i mean that form factor was put in the main doors again mm-hmm. as a symbol of guardians guarding of the tulunadu galaxy the, yeah <laughs> I mean imagine all of this right this is the kind of thought that was going into building these homes they had all these ideas about mm-hmm. uh representation and symbolism and these are not yeah yeah these are not fairly simple concepts they are fairly yeah. complex ideas art movement you could say symbolism yeah, right yeah yeah so they would have these and then they would have the beautiful carvings of if these are not god and goddesses they would have beautiful lotuses Mm. that they would carve they would carve certain lotuses here uh and i've heard uh, some people also uh speculating that these could be certain mandalas mm-hmm. uh because uh there's a whole idea of chakras right you have the seven chakras or the nine chakras i suppose uh and they speak of how these will influence a certain person in the space that they occupy now i don't know i can't mm. verify this for a fact but these are stories i've heard and stories are so important in tulu nadu right yeah. there are so stories many stories are what uh, led the evolution or development of human correct and it's also one way of transferring knowledge because unlike today yeah, we don't yeah, have print yeah. media we don't we didn't have the internet mm. uh, nothing back then basically you're saying a story to transfer mm. <laughs> transfer yeah, yeah this whole this whole moment. idea mm. is is that So yeah I mean uh, that is about the doors so um the main doors also would happen to have double frames and I would again assume this has to do something to do with the security aspect mm. of things uh and a far shorter um yeah height okay and uh, they would have something called a sutra patti in the center okay uh sutra patti uh, essentially as far as I've understood is because these are two different shutters wood has a tendency to shrink and expand as well mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and when it does shrink you don't want anybody being able to peek inside what's happening because your the whole essence of this is that you have enough privacy inside the padasale right? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so when you have a sutra patti you have uh, that privacy aspect intact right so even if it expands 
or uh, shrinks let's say uh, even if that gap is formed the sutra patti will make sure it covers that gap so you would never have a compromise in privacy so these are also probably aspects they observed and then integrated oh, oh, oh. elements oh. into the architecture uh, so this is about the door so we yeah, did they have any sneak in or something like uh, the person who is inside the padasala can uh-huh. like a peek through who is inside i mean who is they, out there as far as i know they didn't have that okay. but they also had very interesting lock systems because earlier in the day you never had the metallic that yeah. we get today the padlocks and all of that so they would have uh, they i mean they call it a kilu mm-hmm. i think uh where on the inside you would have these if this is two shutters let's say hmm. and this is fairly out of proportion but uh this would be a kilu and they would have this system where you, they would have a cross bracing uh-huh. which would move you know one would move this way the other would move this way which uh-huh. would just get locked and there were ways and it was so advanced where they would have the small notch on the inside and mm-hmm, a small mm-hmm. peg of wood that whenever you move it and it gets locked there is no way unless you push this from the bottom yeah you can unlock the door so uh, i mean carpenters were i don't know brilliant in that sense where they have integrated locking systems into place they because it's fairly complex you had like i said today we have computers we have paper and you know pencils and you you know you name mm. it to model this and design this we have entire courses to do this we have product design as a course just yeah, for this yeah. but uh, carpenters didn't have that they had to imagine all of this and try this build this you know a mm. uh, fairly complex system yeah so yeah that's so that's creative. and let's talk also talk about uh, interior design how did uh, interior dis- the interior again wasn't a concept i mm-hmm, think mm-hmm. it was more to do with the lifestyle that they had so they would actually uh, make it very utilitarian okay yeah so they, you need sleeping quarters there was no furniture by the way back okay. in the day um not even a bench not even they did eventually they did develop okay, benches yeah. uh but uh, predominantly it was all, everybody used to stay on the floor mm-hmm. because the house is designed for f- floor seating and yeah. sleeping and all of that so even if you had benches it was not really in your favor to use it because you would sit higher than the window elevation mm-hmm. um but uh, other than this they would do shelving for storage and they would have these internal units mm-hmm. uh which were designed um so this is a wall okay uh, they would uh, the walls were sufficiently thick right so if this is a section of the wall mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on the side if i cut through this yeah uh you would have a niche that they would create and they would have a storage unit underneath right so that is about all that they had other than this they had something called nagandige again uh, it's a local term the terminology is changed from place to place mm-hmm. what's that uh, nagandige would be just a support that they would create and a piece of plank just to put up your you know bottles and mm, okay like that and other than this all the veggies and all of that would be hung from yeah, the ceiling yeah, yeah, yeah. because you don't want rats to mm, you know mess spoiled. around with them so you would hang the onions the 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 other vegetables that they would grow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah good uh did they use any metals or something uh, mm. in any part of the building no they would they would as far as possible avoid it okay. would, if it's wooden they would always use pure wooden Wood, joinery okay. so when you speak about wood did that also include the use of bamboo no bamboo uh, the thing is as far as i've seen bamboo were used earlier in thatch roofs mm-hmm. but as we progressed we didn't use it because probably bamboo actually gets affected by termite quite a bit okay and i would assume that probably was uh, an issue you ha- today you have like they treat it with boric acid and all yeah, of that yeah. but uh, and it's not a skill that people have developed uh, in using bamboo as a timber because up north in assam they would have specific 
joinery details and specific mm-hmm. locking systems to use bamboo but here they never developed it yeah. indigenously mm-hmm. and we have surplus we at least we did have surplus timber yeah. until the whole population boom um so no that was never a cool material so so what are your favorite examples for mm-hmm. tulu architecture you have seen uh predominantly i've seen guttu homes bidu homes my my favorite i mean one of the places and this is a shout out i would like mm-hmm. to give to hastashilpa heritage museum where is that that is in manipal okay and so what style it is bidu they homes? so it is an entire village that they've reconstructed okay. they have homes i think if i'm not wrong up to 40 homes i suppose mm-hmm. or 20 i'm not entirely sure but they have uh, uh, transplanted heritage homes from different parts of uh, tulu nadu okay. to one area of 4 acres that is a government property the government uh, you know sort of leased it out to them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they have built about rebuilt let's say to uh, a certain degree of accuracy uh, to how it was originally okay who who was the architect? this is uh, vijinath chennai okay. uh, who was an enthusiast uh for our culture and heritage and mm-hmm. i would i would go as far as to say in udupi i think he really started a movement and uh, you could even call him a school of thought mm-hmm. um because i know a lot of people who are influenced by vijinath chennai with what he did and what he used to speak of he was a treasure trove of knowledge i personally never got i was fortunate enough mm-hmm. to meet him mm-hmm. but i've met his students okay and then i'm also a student of one of his students so like i said it's a school of thought where it's knowledge, from, is, transferred. knowledge is transferred and there's yeah. a certain sense of so that would be i the would say one. my favorite mm-hmm. place okay is uh, there any other uh there is suralu palace Okay which is in uh, Suralu is a small village i think it's in Cherkadi if i'm not wrong okay. it's close to Cherkadi it's close of right? a king or the landlord a, of a jain king of okay. a jain king okay. yeah so of a feudal, so this was a settlement lord. for jains right the Thulu yes okay. so there are many jain homes and uh, uh, bunt homes mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm. area which i've i've sort of the first two years was just that okay because i had no formal training in tulu architecture and it's not a con- it's not a real i mean uh, uh school in that sense mm-hmm. or uh, there is no course so to speak that was designed for this maybe yeah. now today you have it but you didn't earlier so uh so i went around for the first two years just simply going around seeing a lot of homes and observing mm-hmm. it i till today when i'm driving around i i go slow down when it's a old home and mm-hmm. observe the details of it so you could you i think it's you could say i'm <laughs> i'm technically a thief mm. because i i i steal a lot of details yeah artists steal like uh, yeah because so they steal that. like artists yeah 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 mm. uh i think it was good artists copy great artists steal but then i wouldn't call myself a great yeah. artist <laughs> but uh, that's a slippery slope mm. but uh But yeah I would def- I would definitely say there are so many things that were done in the past mm-hmm. we might as well learn from it you know why reinvent the wheel why not take the knowledge that we have already and probably help upgrade it improve yeah. it yeah 